Welcome to the Lighting Your Way podcast. I'm your host, Guardian Nurses founder, Betty Long. During season three, we'll be delving in deeper to the amazing lives and stories of nurses and other healthcare professionals from around the country. We'll also be talking with a few of my nurse advocate colleagues at Guardian Nurses. You'll get a behind the scenes peek at the healthcare system, as well as get advice on how to get the best care when you or a loved one is a patient. For many years, May 6th was the official start of Nurses Week in the U.S. And each year, the celebration ends on May 12th, which is Florence Nightingale's birthday. In 2022, however, the American Nurses Association has declared May as Nurses Month, which I am very happy to abide by as I love celebrating nurses. So having an additional three weeks is fantastic. And because now I can also use this podcast to celebrate and honor my fellow nurses, for the next several weeks, I will be talking with women who I'm affectionately calling the legends of nursing. These are nurses whom I have the pleasure of knowing who have been in nursing for more than 45 years, some even 50 years. To kick off our Legends episodes, I thought it only right to start with a nurse who inspired me to become a nurse, Marsha Davidson, RN, MSN, CWOCN, which you'll hear Marsha explain is Certified Wound, Ostomy, and Continence Nurse. I met Marsha in February of 1982 when she was caring for my mom, Peg Long, who was a patient on her unit. Marcia worked 3 to 11, so I often saw her when I visited. She took great care of my mom. She made her laugh, and somehow she got me to laugh. One day in particular bonded Marcia and I together for all of these years. It was the day I learned that my mom had terminal cancer. Mom died three months later in May, and one year later, I was in nursing school, a decision that I have never, ever regretted. And it was all thanks to Marcia. So as we prepare to celebrate Nurses Month, let's start with a conversation with Marcia Davidson. Welcome, Marcia Davidson. Um, I am absolutely thrilled to be talking with you, to having you on the podcast, and uh, to having your episode launch uh, what I'm calling the Legends of Nursing uh, podcast, or I'm sorry, the, the Legends of Nursing Month on our podcast. So welcome. Thank you, Betty. Although I guess I am old enough to be a legend. <laughs> Isn't the world I, 70? Right. I think, Over I don't know. Well, it might be 70, might be, who knows? I think 70 is a good place to start because uh, hopefully most nurses at 70 are retired, so I guess the legend status. I'm not sure what the definition is of that. I'll have to check. I'll have to look that up. So thank you again for, for joining uh, me. Um, this this podcast, uh, while typically we talk about cases uh, on the podcast, this isn't really going to be about that. It's going to be about you uh, and your life as a nurse and uh, just talk about nursing in general. So uh, this is going to be fun for me. Hopefully, fun for you. Most most likely, it will be. Right. All right. So let's start with an easy question. <laughs> but I like easy questions. <laughs> yes. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about you growing up. Right. Where did you to give us a sense? Where did you grow up? Where were you born? I was born in northern New Jersey, and moved my father. I uh, got a job in Hatfield, Pennsylvania, which really wasn't on the map in the 50s. Um, so it was somewhat rural. I really had not much memory of living in New northern New Jersey. It was really the place where my extended family was. Although okay. my friends will tease me that I say chocolate instead of chocolate, um, <laughs> which is the only remnant. And drawer, like it's in the drawer. You kind of forget drawer. the... The second syllable there, yeah. Oh, okay. And then, so I, I grew up in Hatfield, and um, and Hatfield's right outside of Philadelphia, right? We're not right outside, but it's north. north. No, Hatfield. Hatfield is yeah, north of of Norristown. Okay. Up that way. Okay. 
Lansdale, Montgomeryville. Okay, so it's it's uh, Montgomery County, I guess Montgomery County, PA. Yes, Montgomery okay. County. And what what did your what did your dad do that he was transferred? He was a um, uh, quality inspector or manager or something like that for uh, castings in the foundry. Okay. Many of the castings were like part of airplanes. He initially worked during the war. He um, worked in uh, light aeronautical. And my my mom was a, uh, she worked as a seamstress in a, not our family, but a family run dry cleaning business. Oh, okay. okay. She did all so, the regions. So what? And so that she was working at the time in, you said the fifties, right? When mom and dad was working in. Right. right. Okay. Uh, and they moved to Hatfield where they raised their family. Uh, you were, uh, how many siblings do you have? I had one sibling who was, who was a lot older than I am and married young. And so I really, I had a, a, an awesome childhood. I had more love than any one person should have because <laughs> my parents had lost a child prior to my birth. So uh-huh. when I came along, everybody was really happy that I was healthy. Right. Okay. And um, so I, even though I had a, an older sibling, I was really raised somewhat as an only child, yet my sister <clears throat> was similar to a rabbit in that she had multiple children very early, like steps. <laughs> Irish twins, I think they're called. <laughs> and... um so when I wanted siblings, because there was less of an age difference between my oldest nephew and myself and my sister and myself, so I could go there and be part of gang. Oh, okay. Or okay. when I got tired of all the noise and clutter, I could come home and, you know, be the darling child. <laughs> so she lived close to, to your parents? She lived close, right. I used to ride oh, okay. my bike there. Oh, that's cool. Okay, great. Um, so, so you you lived this idyllic childhood, <laughs> and then somewhere in there, somewhere in there, you decide, I guess, you're going to be a nurse. Your mom was not a nurse. Were there any nurses in the family? No, neither. N- my paternal grandmother was an LPN by waiver. What's that mean? Which I think it means that you sort of had like on the job training, and the doctor said, "Yeah, okay, you can be a nurse." Okay. That's a, that's a very basic understanding, <laughs> right. but it was something like that. And she was not, I, I don't believe she is the reason I wanted to be a nurse Okay. because she was, I loved her, but she was very stern and very follow the rules, strict, Okay. Um, my way or the highway kind of person. Okay. Not someone who I wanted to model behavior. Right. Okay. But neither of my parents nor my sister graduated from high school. So, um yeah, I had no I had no family pressure to become a nurse or to become anything really. I mean, I could have <laughs> I think my parents would have supported me whatever I wanted to do. Well, that's good in one sense, but doesn't motivate you at all. <laughs> So no, um, I mean I like I had to do something. I don't mean <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean they Here, wanted me to live Marcia. in the basement of my own life. life. <laughs> so what? So what was the? You, you went. So you graduated from high school, and then did you go directly to nursing school? Yes, I did. And and where was that? Where did you go? Montgomery Hospital School of Nursing in Norristown. It was between that or Reading, and um, Reading had a large class. I think of about a hundred, and they were somewhat strict, like. You couldn't have a radio for the first six weeks or six months. I don't remember. Okay. And I had gone to a somewhat large high school, a large graduating class, like about three or 400. So Montgomery had a smaller class. There were 41 probies. Oh. Okay. So I thought I wanted that smaller. Um, experience. Experience. Yeah. So you, so, I so, you there. so you go into Montgomery, um, and it's 41 students you're practicing probably right away because it's a diploma program, right? Right. It was a diploma program. Right. And, and then you're, you're on the floor and you graduate in what, two or three years? 
three in September three. of seventy. Okay, so you you head out into your career, and and where do you go? I went with a classmate to Marstown Memorial in northern New Jersey. Worked on a medical floor there. I was so green. Oh, good God, I was green. Um, and um, then because I was young and and had wanderlust and loved the shore, went to work at Shore Memorial and lasted there three months. I really felt, even as a, a relatively young graduate, that I could not abide by some of the practices or lack thereof I saw there. And again, this is in the early 70s. So um, from there, because I had a lease on an apartment, I went to the Seashore House, which was um, in Ventnor at the time. And it was fun there because a lot of, there were maybe six of us from Montgomery who worked there on different floors and different shifts. So that was kind of fun. And what was the, what was the, uh, what was the goal of the Seashore House? Tell me. The Seashore House was a um, rehab uh, kind of skilled care facility for children. Oh. Oh, okay. So I worked on, I worked on a um, school age, the school age kids. They had babies, and then they also upstairs they had uh, teenagers, like okay. uh, eleven and up. And so. did you what? Did you always? I know that when you and I met, you were working evening shift. Was that always your shift? No, I worked days there. So you went from Morristown Memorial to Jersey Shore yes. to the Seashore House, right? So that's yes, which a was couple... in Ventnor. So I was, yeah. And I worked there for probably nine months just to finish out my lease. And then I got to missing adults, so I went to Lankanal. And when I worked at Lankanal, my dad um, died very unexpectedly. So I left to take some time off to help my mom. And then when I went back to work, I went to Bridmore. Uh, and Bridmore Hospital. It was my, Bridmore so Hospital. This is... And it was like my fifth job in four years or something like that. But that was in 74 when if you had half an arm and half a brain, they would hire you because there was such a shortage in nursing. (laughs) So they did. That is not, that is not why they hired you, obviously, because you, I know you have at least two arms. (laughs) I, yes, I do have two arms and three quarters of a brain, but, um, (laughs) I, I was happy because um, I it was a 3 to 11 position, which is what I wanted, because I'd worked 3 to 11 at Lank and all. And they were delighted because I wanted 3 to 11. And it was on um, a medical ward floor, which I absolutely loved. Medical floor with uh, with a tad of alcohol detox. Okay. <laughs> thrown and, in for, for um, good. Thrown in, yeah. One person, uh, someone had once described that floor that if the you needed to give the hospital an enema. They would you would insert the rectal tube there, but it was a place where if you liked it, you stayed there. So the people who were there loved it because okay. everybody else would transfer off. But I loved it. It was grand, okay. and I learned so much. It, yeah, because you're still so, pretty much a rookie at that point, right? Yeah, well, I'm five years out, so I'm not. I'm I'm rookie-ish. Yeah, but um, it was great. And how, so let, let's step back. If you can remember, you know, cause I know you're over 70. Yeah. <laughs> if you can remember, what did, what did nursing practice look like back then? Like what was the patient to nurse ratio on a ward? Well, it, right? would be the, it was a, it was a 41 bed floor and it was divided into two wings. Okay. Um, either odd or even. And I think the even had, 20 patients and the odd had 21. So okay. it would be you and an LPN. And if it was a good night, it would be you and an, you and LPN and an aide. Or sometimes it would be you and an aide. So you would do meds treatments and there was no computers. It was all handwritten. Oh. And your meds, you had like little pill cups that you filled in the med room. Right. 
um, you know, the meds weren't as difficult as they are now because there weren't as many of them. Right. You know? Good point. Um, but but you had, am I hearing you, you had 20 patients? Yes. Wow. And, you know, in those days you did things like, well, I used to love it. I used to feel like I was the mother. Because okay. during the day, there was all the hubbub, and people went to x-ray, and they did this, and they did that. And then they, they'd come back for dinner. They'd be home by, or in their rooms by dinner. <laughs> and then they'd, play, they'd have their family come in, and then you'd put them to bed. You'd give them juice, and you'd rub their backs, and you'd empty their trash, and you'd put, do whatever treatments needed to be done. You'd put them to bed. <laughs> and hope that they sleep through the night. And hope that they slept through the night. Right. Exactly. So it wasn't um, a surgical floor, so you didn't have a lot of post-op no, it patients. Was, it, no, okay. it was medical. I, I always preferred me- medicine. Okay. So and the nice thing... Go ahead. No, no. No, keep, continue. The, the thing that I liked was... Um, the And, and it, had, it had three and four bed... Mostly four bedrooms. Okay. Right, because I um, remember... My mom was in a, a room with four other, right. well, three other women. Yes, she was in 2063 by the window. I don't know why I remember that, but I do. Jeez, <laughs> ought to play that number, 2063. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was, um, and then in 83, when DRGs came, the, um, my floor closed, and I was transferred up to the um med surge, the private floors, which I thought was great because finally someone who didn't have money could be in a two-bed room. I thought that Uh, was wonderful. So that's why, um, wait, the private rooms were people who had money? What do you mean? I mean, everybody had insurance. Yeah, like like the the ward people, right, but the ward people were in four bedrooms. What what, what does ward people mean? Tell me. People who either had minimal insurance or didn't have a physician. Oh. Had the hospital had the interns and residents or the oh, primary okay. care, okay, the physicians. Okay. Anyway, so at that time, then nursing diagnosis was coming into play, and so was primary nursing, which I absolutely thought was great. Okay. Um, that you were that person's director of their care and overseer, right. and kind of guardian in a sense, right. not to use your word. Right. I'm it's okay. Board, it's guess. okay. It's not my work. Um, okay. But so, so you're, all right. So you're, let me go back to something you said about putting, you know, your folks to bed. One of the things which I think is missing, uh, you said, you know, you gave them a back rub and you emptied their trash, right. which, you know, that's, right. wow. You're, you're doing and you, both now. I know. And, and you, you make sure that, um, like everything was there that they needed. Their tissues were there. Their water was there. Their call bell was there. Right. Um, you know. I mean, I I remember well, when I started nursing that that you know back right when you worked uh, night shift. I worked seven p to seven a, but that you did offer the patient a back rub, right? And I I think that's you know you're really dating yourself when you say that today because I don't think anybody uh, offers back rubs to patients. If you want me to date myself, can I tell you that I learned to give injections, IM injections in glass syringes? We did have disposable needles. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Makes me feel like I should be a hundred. <laughs> um, so, all right. So you go to the med search floor. You're still at Bryn Mawr, right? Uh, I'm still and then, at Bryn Mawr. Yep. And how, then, how long did you stay on the med search floor? Oh, till... I guess eighty, some eighty-eight, maybe somewhere in there, eighty-five, eighty-eight. I hurt my back and I was out of work for a while. And when I came back, well, I'd gone to days when I went upstairs. Okay. And then I hurt my back, and then at work. Yes. Yeah. That was like, uh, I think eighty-five, eighty-six, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. And then I went back to work, and then I heard it again in 88. And then when I went back to work in 88, I was offered a 3 to 11 educator position. 
Oh, okay. So I took that. And then I was there for several years doing that. And then I was the, or I moved to Days and became the orientation instructor. Okay. And at the same time, the the ET, an osteomal therapy nurse, now called the wound ostomy continence nurse, was um, kind of mentoring me from that perspective because mm-hmm. I, somewhere in the mid 80s, uh, duoderm came out, which was a hydrocolloid, which was yep. a, a wound dressing that you put over a wound and left in place. Yeah. And it was like, it was phenomenal. It was earth shattering. It was magical that the oh. wounds would heal under this. Okay. So I got very interested in wounds and wound care. Anyway, so at that point, then I was the um, the orientation instructor, taught CPR some classes, and I was at that point. I guess I went. I was starting my master's. I'd gone to Penn State locally for my bachelor's. Started my master's. And um, what else was I doing? Oh, I went to WCN school, Wound Ostomy Continence Nurses School. Okay. So I was, I had that job. And then the diabetes educator, the nursing diabetes educator, went out on pregnancy leave. And I then became the diabetes educator. And at that point, that's a lot I of, felt that's like... That's a lot of hats, Marsh. It's a lot of hats. I couldn't do any job well. Yeah. And I really, really just, my passion, I was so passionate that I just wanted to be a wound ostomy continence nurse. Okay. So a, a colleague of mine had gone to start up a cardiac program in home care affiliated with Brimar. And at that point, the home care became part of mainline, the home care agency became part of mainline health. Okay. So I was offered a position as the ET or wound ostomy continence nurse for home care. And it was great because everything came with me, all my benefits and seniority and everything came with me. And so that's and, where and I... That was, that was and that was a day shift. So you just were doing one job as opposed to four. Right. Now, one right. job that I really, really loved. And um, I kind of set up the program because I was the first. WCN there. See, so you are a really legend. Exciting. Exactly. I knew that you were a legend. <laughs> and and I, I just loved it. I loved home care. Um, a, a lot of people don't really understand home care, but home care is a very exciting place to work. It's hard. Um, it's a lot of travel in and out of the car. You're lugging your, your bag in. Um, but it's it's where you really get to see the whole person. Right. You get to see what affects them, what their family life, what their living conditions are, and it's on their terms. Right. One thing that really, and this may sound like a stupid example, but stood out to me. After I'd been in home care for a while, I was asked to go back to the hospital to do a stoma sighting for someone who was going to have a colostomy because the, the WCN was all for, I don't know, for whatever reason. And I went in, and um, the person needed something from their overbed table or their, not their overbed table, their nightstand. Yeah. And I asked them if I could, if I could look into it, and they were like amazed oh, because in the you hospital, asked. as a nurse, okay. you just open that because it's oh, yours. Right. It's right. your, it's your hospital. Right. So it gives you a whole different perspective when you're in someone's home. Interesting. Okay. So, you know, so let you're, me, you're, you're their guest, really. Yeah. And, and I think to your point, it, it is hard because it's, um, you see someone in their natural habitat and, and you have to be respectful because they're allowing you into their home as opposed to, to your point, right. going into a room and saying, hi, Mrs. Smith, I'm your nurse, right? You, you, you have exactly. to get into the and home. And this is and, my domain. Right. 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 I get that. So let me go circle back. I I heard you say you hurt your back twice in the hospital. Was that because you were lifting patients? A lot of, a lot of folks don't understand how physical nursing is, 
right, as a job in the hospital um, where young nurses, young women, men are lifting patients or, you know, pivoting them or things happen, right? So what, what was your um, mechanism of injury for the back problem? back injury? Probably a short, chubby little lady named Phyllis who had a <laughs> thigh-high cast and needed to get out on the commode several times during my shift. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then the second time, I forget what happened the second time, but I had herniated a couple of discs. And um, the last time was really bad because I actually had to crawl out of a patient's room. It was rather embarrassing. Oh, yikes. But anyway, um, I live to tell the tale, and I'm still here. So. Right. Have you had back problems since then? Has that been a chronic issue? It's a chronic issue. I mean, it, it's, it, you know, it has its good days and bad days. Yeah, it's, I, I just wanted to bring light to that because I heard, because a lot of nurses do, uh, you know, they, they get injured at work because oh, it is, a, particularly right. now, I mean, think about it. You had 20 patients which is absurd now, right? Even with an LPN and well, with an aide. Yes, but, but Betty Youngson, you must realize that some of these people were walkie-talkies. They were people uh, who were in for a barium enema or an upper GI. Oh, uh, okay. You know, people came uh, into the hospital for that. True. The, yeah, I mean, the, my, the acuity I do say level that. was much less. Yeah, I do. That's much true. Less. Good point. Thank you for bringing that because I do remember when I say when I talk about my mom being in the hospital when we met, um, you know, she was there for a week because she was being worked up, you know, for her cancer diagnosis. And it was like you wouldn't right. you do that outpatient now. Right. So, you know, right. maybe mom went for a test one day it's and then came different. back. Right. Yeah. OK. And things were different then. I mean, you didn't you didn't have um, monitors or you didn't have like not generally on the floor. You didn't right. have people on ventilators. You didn't have um, uh, PCAs or something monitoring the drips of the IVs. You calculated them yourself. It was right. a very, it was a very, very different. Good point. Very Thank different. you for pointing that out. Um, so, let, tell me. I'm always curious about nursing uniforms. Um, back in the day when you were uh, in the hospital at, at Bryn Mawr. What what uniforms the, were at, well at Bryn Mawr at, at Bryn Mawr I got I finally got out of dressings and went into pantsuits with my clinics always okay. my clinics the clinic shoes okay and my clinic what, shoes absolutely were, were nurses wearing scrubs then no ah okay <clears throat> no scrubs and caps you wore your caps which was always uh, an issue for me because caps were caps were they always would get stuck when you would pull a curtain closed. Your cap would be like cockeyed on your head in the sideways. <laughs> I remember wearing nursing caps in high, sc uh, high school, in nursing school, and I did not like them. They were not very practical at all. No, they were not practical. So I was glad to see them go. <laughs> um, I know a lot of, in fact, when I was in nursing school, it was uh, the early 80s, and uh, I was always curious. We didn't have, I think we had one or two, uh, men in our class. And I asked the instructor why the men didn't have to wear the cap. Um, so <laughs> it's like, well, when they have to wear them, I'll wear them. But alas, I had to, I had to acquiesce and follow the, follow the rules. Um, so, so you talk about being a certified wound ostomy continence nurse. So that has evolved from the enterostomal therapist, right? The ET right. you talk and, about the enter. Right. Enostomal therapy really initially many of the people who were enostomal therapists were not nurses, but were people who had ostomies themselves and oh, okay. uh, helped others. And then nursing became involved and it just progressed. You know, because nurses were used to or ETs nurses and otherwise, were used to dealing with skin conditions, uh, uh, peristomal skin conditions, um, then it just seemed the natural way to go to include skin with the care of ostomies. And, God. and then I guess because we, we were comfortable with things below the waist, we ended up with continence as well. And okay. because of continence, 
effect on, on incontinence effect on skin and otherwise. So right, um, right. I think that was some of the impetus to have the name changed from Enol Stomal Therapy to Wound Ostomy Continence Nurses Society. And how how long, we, when you said you went to pursue your certification in that, how long was that and what kind of training was it? Was it outside of the hospital or it was, was it inside? Um, it was outside the hospital. It was a um, a month of classes every day. Um, and I went to Lucy Wick School, which was up in um, Harrisburg and Camp Hill and stayed there. And then... Um, I forget how many clinical hours I needed, maybe a month of clinical hours. I'm not really sure. And I did that uh, with my mentor, Margaret Goldberg, at uh, Crozier, Okay. which was very interesting because it was a different population than I was used to at, um, at Mainline right. Health. Okay. Yeah, so one of the things that I love about nursing is the fact that there are so many uh, unique um, and creative ways to practice, right? So you are a med surge nurse, uh, you, you know, you've done peds work, you've done adult work, and then you find yourself kind of attracted to working with wounds and, and ostomies, right? And then you certify in that and become an educator and, and a consultant for patients who are dealing with maybe getting uh, an ostomy or other wounds, right? So that you're working with them long term. That's what I think the beauty, one of the things uh, of, about nursing that I love is that there's so many facets of it that you can oh, specialize there are in. So many facets. Right. Initially, it was wounds that I was interested in. Why? I what? what to, why? What was? Just that they would heal. Like you could get this hole in somebody's butt to heal. Okay. And we've come such a long way from when we, I can remember when I worked on the medical floor at Brimmore, we yeah. would take regular adhesive tape, turn somebody on their side, take regular adhesive tape, tape their butt, shear their butt, tape it to the side rail, okay? Tape the tape to the side rail, <laughs> put a heat lamp on there and stuff Maalox and Betadine in there. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, I'm telling you, I can't tell you what things I've done to wounds. But anyway. (laughs) No wonder you thought Duoderm was like magic. Uh, Magic. Wow. Anyway, um, but once I started caring for people with ostomies, I just, I absolutely loved them. I loved it. To be able to to be with someone who is, it's not really the best time of their life. Not many people are jumping up and down when they say, oh, by the way, you're going to have a colostomy or an early ostomy or you're your ostomy. And then you get them through that, you you help them through that, and then they become independent. And to me, that was awesome. I mean, you you educate them, they make their own decisions, they're involved in their self-care. It just was the best. Right. And and that was where, like, the, you practiced that in the home care division at Mainline Health yes. for years, right? That yeah, was your... mostly, right. I, I was triple certified, but it was really wounds and ostomies that I did the most, okay. um, just because of the need. Okay. Right, because let's face it, there, and, and as particularly as um, I know several friends who have had ileostomies, right? Um, and it is, it's a, it's a not a great time in their lives. So, um, so, so what, when you look back, right? I mean, what did you, I can certainly hear uh, the passion in your voice when you talk about the certificate, you know, doing the wound ostomy continence training and, and to work with patients in their home. What, so is that really where your sweet spot was? I mean, what, what do you love about oh, nursing? Absolutely. I think what I love is just the interaction with people and being able to get them through a difficult time, whatever that is. Um, and and being able to give them the information that they need to make whatever decision works for them. You know, whether or not it would be something I supported, it's, to me, it was always their choice. Right. Their, their decision. 
I don't know if that answers your question. But. Yeah, I well, and I think I can put it in context is that it, when I met you, at, you know, I was a college student and didn't know what nurses did. I mean, I kind of d- did, but I, I didn't see them for what they were doing. And what struck me about you when you interacted and cared for my mom was that you were so um, easy with her, right? You, you joked around with her despite, you know, a difficult time trying to get a diagnosis of what was going on with her. Um, you were really easy with her. You made her feel, you made me feel um, comfortable, right? Cause I didn't know, like you probably saw my eyes like, oh, my God, I'm in a hospital because I had never been in a, probably in a hospital, particularly with my mom being there. But I think that was what I saw in you. And that's what I when I think back on my decision to become a nurse because of your interaction with my mother and me. Right. That it was like I thought it, it was about people. Right. And I thought I love people. I love helping people. Uh, you know, that I could be a well, nurse and that's what I, but that's because of you seeing you interact with your patients and seeing you, you know, joke, all right, Peg, roll over. We're going to give you a shot. You know, back when you were probably using that glass syringe <laughs> to help. No, but that, no, that was at Montgomery, not, <laughs> not, in, um, not in Primmore. They, they were fancy there. They had plastic syringes. <laughs> But they also, but you gave pain, sh- you gave pain medicine, you know, in the um, butt, right? It wasn't IV, oh, yeah. it wasn't, oh, right, yeah. right. So I think that's what the, what I, what I enjoyed seeing about you and, and then your impact on me was that it was really about people, right? Yes, there's science. Yes, there's math. Yes, there's a lot of other stuff to it. But at the end of the day, it's really about helping that person, to your point, through a difficult time. Um, and 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 being being having empathy for them because it's so difficult. Right. And look, you you really need to see what it is they're experiencing as much as you can. You know, is it the caregiver who's worried about their husband with dementia, or it the mother who's in with phlebitis and wondering who's taking care of her kids? It, you know, is it the husband who now this disease he's not going to be able to work I mean whatever it is you just have to meet them and, and help them through it and humor has always worked with me I mean my both my parents had great sense of humor just okay you know and and, and I was blessed to have that transferred to me I think right well I I tell uh friends and anybody who listened uh when I came and met you I guess it was maybe 10 years into my nursing career and I saw you uh at a bar, I think, and I said, um, "Hey, Marcia." At a ball game, thank you very much. <laughs> hey, Marcia, you know, I I just want to let you know you're the reason I became a nurse, and you, in perfect style and and you know timing, said, "Don't don't blame that on me," <laughs> <laughs> which was well, like, took me back. Like, wait, no, so I couldn't think to be anything else. It's all I ever wanted to be. Yeah, I, like there was just no, no uh, other option. I just had to be. Well, I had to. I had to do whatever I had to do to be a nurse. That's that was great. it. That's great. So, so let's let's fast forward to your to your retirement. So, uh, you know, we joke. Um, one of my friends and I joke that nurses don't retire; they just go per diem. Um, but you did retire from active practice. I think it was uh, August of 2017. So, so at that point, you're 47 years in. God bless you. Um, uh, what led you to that decision? What was, you know, ha- ha- here's somebody, you know, you love nursing, you love working with your patients, and uh, yet you're facing, you know, you're getting older, right? I'm getting older. And like I said, physically, home care is hard. You're going up steps, you're going in houses, you're going everywhere, you know, and I had a huge territory. um, So I was, you know, you're in and out of the car four or five times, six times a day. And um, my spouse was very insistent that I retire and I didn't really want to. Um, But I finally agreed to knowing that I could go back and work up to 30 hours a week, 30 hours a month. Still See, be eligible you, ju- for my you just, 
Exactly. You just go per diem. Right. <laughs> okay. But unfortunately, in the, the after the third week of my retirement, I became significantly ill and oh. was hospitalized and was ill for about a, a year and a half till I really got back to any semblance of myself. And that negated my return to to work, which took me even longer to accept that than to get better. Um, uh-huh. It was really, really difficult for me. And I really, really missed it and resented that I couldn't go back. Uh-huh. I mean, not that anybody was stopping me other than my health. Right. But um, there was no way that I could I could do that. Well, I think health is <laughs> important. You've spent your life taking care of other people, um, you know, and it's time to take care of yourself, which a lot of nurses don't do that well. So uh, no, a lot so, of nurses don't do that well. No. Um, so was the nursing care at that point like you're looking back? Um, are, were you hospitalized for that part? Any part of the yeah. year and a half? Okay. And yeah. what was the nursing oh, care well. like for you? Did anybody offer to rub your back? Not a soul offered to rub my back. <laughs> right. um, uh, you know, it was good and bad. Um, it's it's a different, it's, it's very hard to compare nursing today versus nursing early on in my career. They're just, the, the demands of nurses today are so very different. And the delegation of some of the tasks that were associated with nursing take the nurse away from you. Right. So that you don't have that interaction where when you're making that bed, that patient's going to talk to you about things. Hmm. Right, because you're probably um, not making the bed. Somebody else is making, you're not the, making bed. the bed. Right. You're not giving them their bath. You're right. not dipping their hand in the basin of water because it feels good. And it's the only time they've had water touch their hands for the whole time they've been in the hospital, that kind of stuff. You just, the, the, the nurses, the, the system doesn't allow for that. Right. And, and to your point about acuity, the, the patients that are there in the hospital now are there for, you know, two, three days. Right. In, out. Right. Yeah. Unless you're really sick. Now, I, I when, when I was going for my bachelor's, there was a, a nurse there who said that, um, and this is in the late 80s, ni- early 90s, said that the people in ICU are now on the floor. Right. And the people who were dead were now in ICU. <laughs> Right, and that was the nineties. Imagine, what's... and that was in the that, right. That right. was in the late eighties, early nineties. Right. Yeah. Right. Imagine what it's like now. All right, it's so let's talk so about fun. your your um future. So you and your spouse, I think, are looking for a continuing care community. Um, thinking about yes, we are your retirement or or your care post retirement. Did did being a nurse play into that decision to pick a continuing care? Uh, community? Absolutely. Absolutely. So tell me a little bit more about that. When I worked in home care, when I worked in home care, I saw people who, elderly people who were barely making it on their own. They didn't have support. If they, if they were coupled, their partner, their spouse, whatever, might be in a facility and they hadn't seen them for months because they didn't have any way to get there either because they were disabled or they didn't have any transportation or they didn't have the money for transportation to get there. And I just didn't want that to happen to us. Um, We don't have children. We just had dogs and cats. We don't have children. And there's, there's, as I say, there's no one's going to wipe my butt, you know, and make sure my whiskers are plucked. So um, I really felt like we needed to go somewhere. It took a while for my staff to get that. Okay. But um, I had the same thing about talking her into a generator because I saw, I saw, again, elderly people at home with no resources. When the mm-hmm. power goes out, they, they, they're cold. They, right. you know, they don't have refrigeration. They don't, they, they, they don't have heat. Mm-hmm. So 
I did not want us to be in that situation. Yeah, well, I, I that's so, a yeah, great it had a, a huge a huge impact on our decision to go. Yeah, and if you're, I think to your point, you know, having uh, had a career in nursing, taking care, particularly in home care, and and realizing that you know you might want to. Uh, live your golden years uh, well cared for and, and safe so that the pressure and the, the stress, I guess, of, of where and, you know, what's and what's going to happen. If... The, key word, but it, the key word, I think there is safe. I saw so many people who really, like I said, didn't have, there were other people who had wonderful resources, family members, people, you know, husbands who bent over backwards for them, all kinds of things, all kinds of situations. I mean, right. I could name hundreds of them, right. but, um, when when it was bad, it was bad. Okay. Um, okay. So I have so two of the questions that we're going to ask our team at Guardian Nurses for Nurses Month, back again to uh, the celebration of nurses. Um, I heard you mention Margaret Goldberg. So who, when you think back on your career, uh, and there may be many, but who do you remember as your mentor? I think I many nurses, many things, but I think from my specialty perspective, the wound ostomy, the ET at Bryn Mawr, Barbara Modic, was the one who kind of took me under her wing and showed me things. And then when I went through my, my WCM program, my preceptor was Margaret Goldberg. And Margaret, through Margaret, who was very active in our society, was president of, of our um, local uh, group and also of our regional group introduced me to really literally living legends, active legends within the Wound Ostomy Continent Nurses Society. Okay. So really, Margaret. Okay, great. Um, okay, the the, the uh, final question. What is yes, a, what, through your career, what is a value that you lived by in your practice of nursing? Well, I think respect and honesty. Okay. I, I think I think it's so important to respect that individual that it's not just a diagnosis in that bed, that it's a person who has wants and needs and concerns and and anxiety and desires and all that and more. That's a, that's a very uh, honest answer. Thank you. Well, honest it is. Yes. Um, so nurse Davidson, as I like to call you, I am very yes, proud nurse of you, Long. proud of your career and proud that we are friends. And, and again, uh, I know that I've said this to you. Thank you for all that you've done uh, for me uh, and for all of the thousands of patients that you have uh, cared for and for all the nurses that you've mentored. Betty, I could not be more honored to be your friend, for sure. And I do believe you give me so much more credit than I deserve. But if it makes <laughs> you happy, I'm happy. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, and I look forward to uh, celebrating Nurses Month with you. Thanks for being with me today. You're welcome, Betty. Bye-bye. Bye. If you have any questions that you would like us to address in a future episode, please email us at podcast at guardiannurses.com. That email again is podcast at guardiannurses.com. We would love to hear from you. Thank you for joining us this week. You can find the Lighting Your Way podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google, YouTube, Spotify, and Stitcher. If you liked what you heard, tell a friend and leave us a review. You can learn all about Guardian Nurses Healthcare Advocates on our website, guardiannurses.com. So until next time, find some joy in your life, pet all the good doggies and kitties, and remember to tell your people that you love them. Take care.